Hello, everyone. How are you? Welcome to our Silicon Dragon series online. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. So today we have a very special guest uh, joining us, John Chambers, uh, who is the CEO and founder of JC2 Ventures and uh, also former Cisco CEO. Um, hello, John, how are you? Rebecca, I'm great. It's great to join you today. I look Thank forward you. to our healthy give and take. Uh, absolutely, yes. So uh, let me just give a, a few uh, preview remarks and introduce, introduce you to everyone. Uh, so today, uh, as I mentioned, um, January 21st, 4 p.m. Pacific time, we have John Chambers on as our special guest. It's a real privilege. And uh, here, uh, I'm just sharing a few photos of here's John at work uh, at his wonderful place, uh, his hideaway. Uh, so I uh, hope you, you can all see the photo here of John at work in Palo Alto, right, John? That's exactly what it is. I overlook, I can see San Francisco to San Jose. I see the mountains behind and these are my sporting stuff that I love with sports teams. And these are the business accomplishments. Nobody wants to talk about the business accomplishments. They want to talk about sports and the, oh, okay. years, the 49ers and everything. But it's oh. a different background than you traditionally see. Oh yeah, no, I love it. I, I think it look, looks great. And um, apparently uh, you got some tips from uh, Branson on this, right? I actually did. You're, you're, you got a great memory. Uh, it's about a decade ago, Richard Branston, when I visited him uh, in the UK, uh -huh. I went to his home and he had a big table like the one you see in front of me with couches down the side and two chairs on the other side. And I looked at it walking in. It was in his living room. That's where he did business. And I thought, this doesn't look very functional. And uh -huh. as I sat down, first, the guy's fascinating and fun to talk with. But halfway through the meeting, I realized I got to have me that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And so I took the concept, the uh, system actually goes up and down, forward and backwards off of this with uh, lifts or non-lifts. So I have oh, a 52 oh, inch TV screen on the other side, four screens that I work off of, but you learn from others. And you know, one of the things about asking a VC anything, the concept is key. How do you learn from others so you, you can key off of what they've done well and perhaps avoid their mistakes? So uh, setting up the culture that you want, the message in is key, but this is identical to what you see today. Absolutely, that's great. Okay, so today um, as we get started, we're having a dialogue, a chat, and we'll have audience Q&A in a little while. And we'll do our regular poll and there are sign off and post at the end. Um, I, John, I already have I, my Diet Coke, so I'm all set for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I have mine too, but it's not Diet Coke. I know Diet Coke is your favorite drink, right? It is. It is. <laughs> okay. Well, good. Uh, so, all right. Now, who is John Chambers? In case you don't know, I put together this cheat sheet for everyone to see. Uh, he grew up in Charleston, West Virginia, a rare VC who was a CEO at a tech titan resides in Palo Alto. Uh, first job was IBM? Correct. Yeah, okay, then Wang Laboratories, then Cisco for 26 years. In where in during that time, he grew Cisco to a huge, huge company. Uh, it's now what, $49 billion in revenue? Um, but um, just an amazing growth rate. Uh, so, and I remember uh, when I was editing International Business Magazine in New York City, uh, we had John Chambers on our cover as the uh, fastest growing, uh, running the fastest growing small to medium sized company in the US and that was Cisco. But that was way back, that was like two decades ago, John or more. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, at that point, I know Cisco was not where it is now in terms of revenues or uh, employees. Well, it was fun. It, uh, we started, I joined the company when there were 400 employees and, and uh, uh, after I joined the company, uh, I kept getting complaints about my truck drivers, uh, assuming I was Cisco, the food delivery service. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, we took it from 70 million in sales to 48 billion when I left. 
uh, and from 400 employees to 75,000. We were fortunate enough to create 10,000 millionaires among our employees. And wow. if you invested a dollar in stock, uh, when you know, I, I joined Cisco, you would have made $1,500 on each dollar you invested. So the returns were outstanding. Wow, that's incredible. Well, and I know you have a lot of these lessons that you learned uh, from Ronnie Cisco in your book, um, Connecting the Dots. And um, it's a great book. I've been reading it and uh, underlining things while well, marking it. I, I haven't underlined it because I don't want to ruin it, but I, I keep marking it uh, with little um, uh, book, um, uh, oh, book, what do they call them? Uh, gee whiz. Um, uh, the stickers that go on top and you put the right. keys on them, etc. Right. Uh, yeah, like I'll send you another book, Rebecca, because for me, the biggest thrill I get is I love to help train people and to teach. And it's my way of giving back. And you know somebody's getting really good use out of your books. And thank you for sending me your two. Uh, allows, uh, when you see it underlined and dog-eared, dog you know they're using it regularly, not as a oh, one-time yeah. read, but something that's kind of, hopefully their Bible in terms of business and direction and how you do things, whether you're talking about China as you did in your, your one of your books, or for me, it was literally how do you do marketing transitions and how do you differentiate and what are leadership mistakes and qualities I look for in the future. Very good. We're going to get into that as well as we uh, go into our Q&A here. But uh, let me give you a little bit more background about John. Uh, okay, he grew up in Charleston and he didn't have to go too far for uh, West Virginia University, uh, where he got uh, his law degree as well as Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Arts. An MBA at Indiana University, sticking with the Midwest, and um, came out to Silicon Valley to run Cisco. Um, in the meantime, as you just heard, Cisco became a huge company, and um, John set up the um, or established, helped to establish the John Chambers College of Business and Economics. This is part of John's give back strategy, and I like to highlight this give back strategy because it really is impressive uh, what you're doing, John, in, in West Virginia and at West Virginia University. Um, it's just amazing. And uh, I was just recently there. I saw the, the new home for the Vantage Ventures, the Startup Accelerator, and I saw the new Reynolds Hall, uh, which is going up for the uh, new business school. Um, and, um, and then on top of that, um, you're helping West Virginia as a startup state. Um, helping to bring Hyperloop in for their testing certification side in West Virginia. So uh, I'd love to hear how you were able to do that because I know there was a lot of competition among states for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, at the bottom here, a little bit, I ad lived about, uh, well, what does John do in his spare time if he has any spare time? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I put down fly fishing. Um, uh oh, well. I don't see it up there. If I did, I'd give you the duck call. I was just duck hunting yesterday, but yes, I love the outdoors. Okay. Uh, okay. I put duck, duck calling instead of duck hunting. So <laughs> I, 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 I did a little censorship there. Politically correct. Okay, exactly. Exactly. But anyhow, and I got diet Coke in here as well. Um, okay. We like to have fun in our shows. Uh, Absolutely. So, uh, okay, what is JC2 Ventures? All right. Uh, so here, um, I really uh, tried to crystallize uh, some of the lessons that John has learned, and also um, what JC2 Ventures does. And so JC2 Ventures has already invested in 20 startups, and I believe it's four unicorns already, uh, John? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm looking maybe a, a fifth one to be added fairly soon. Yes, I hope. I, I hope to, my definition of success is out of the 20, we get 10 to 12 unicorns uh, from them. Wow, that's that's a high standard. That's a high bar. I have an unfair um, advantage. I get to pick any startup in the world as the, the company that I spend time with and coach and mentor. So uh, it's the advantage of doing 180 acquisitions, as you said, and then being able to coach these young companies to scale and grow. So I get an unfair advantage in terms of my selection process. Right, so you wanna be early and then let the follow on investors make it a unicorn, right? 
Well, we do it together, but the, the concept is every investor, I want to make money. That's how I've lived my life. It's like every customer that I've ever sold to, the best of my knowledge, I can sell to today because my currency is purely track record, relationships and trust and building that trust is so key. Okay, I actually, uh, that's one of the um, key lessons I put here. Um, information and trust are currencies for companies. I thought that was really interesting. Um, I liked uh, your uh, other ideas here about how uh, things that you've learned at Cisco that you're applying today in your venture capital practice. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, like I said, I, I have a lot of takeaways from your book. So a lot of these are in your book. Don't do the right thing too long. Uh, disrupt or be, be disrupted. Look for the industry disruptors. And then I was thinking about flip video cameras. Um, so I guess it's a good thing that uh, Flip is no longer part of the whole Cisco uh, portfolio because smartphones took over, right? Well, a little bit. Uh, you mean, as we'll talk a little bit later, I always start with the big picture. Uh, at Cisco, I wanted to lead in data with the internet, then voice over the internet, then video over the internet. We became the dominant player in uh, video capabilities for entertainment, cable set top boxes, et cetera. And the logic extension to me was home videos through Flip, which is a, a camcorder of type, very small, really good. But Steve Jobs held it up on stage and said, this is an amazing product Cisco has. And uh, my team said, isn't that neat? And I said, no, watch what happens next. He said, I'm gonna give it to you for free. And uh, he just outmaneuvered me. If we'd moved the video capability from the flip to other smartphones, we could have potentially outmaneuvered Apple. Uh, once I realized that, candidly, although out of 180 acquisitions, Flip wasn't in the top 20, uh, it's often the one that people use saying, well, this was a mistake. I don't view it as a mistake. I took risk. I said one out of three uh, of my acquisitions will fail. That year, we did a $3.2 billion acquisition, a $2.1 billion acquisition, and $600 million on Flip, and Flip failed. Uh, do I wish it hadn't? Of course. Did I love the product? Oh, yes. Uh, but as a venture capitalist, I am a risk taker, and I expect a given failure rate uh, on it overall. And that's just part of, of the role that I play. The key is if you're going to fail, fail fast and realize when you get outmaneuvered, if you can't correct quickly, change directions. Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, that's one of the takeaways here. Take risk and move fast. Think like a teenager. Move like a teenager. Yes. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, anticipate failure. No pause or rewind button. None. None. Be curious. That's a good Every one. good CEO that I've ever worked with was really curious. And some of the, the amazing government leaders that uh, I've met, Shimon Perez out of Israel, who unfortunately passed several years ago. But at 94 years of age, he was amazingly respected around the world, unbelievably curious uh, about technology, startups, et cetera, uh, on it. And government leaders who I've found are really, really good are also very curious. A Prime Minister Modi out of India, where I'm, his, he would call me his, his global ambassador for the country on digitization, et cetera remarkably curious about understanding issues. So are most people, whether you're the leader of the company or the individual contributor, I look for curiosity to be a key aspect of a future success. Oh, that's good, that's good. Well, let me uh, stop the share here uh, for a second um, and get to our questions. So uh, I'd love to delve into some of these questions that I've outlined here about uh, sharing your success uh, strategies, okay. your criteria for investing. So why, why don't we just, uh, I'll stop the share here since uh, uh, I've given you an idea and given the audience an idea of the kind of questions we're gonna be asking. And okay. then, uh, yeah, and so then uh, as we go through this uh, later on, uh, people can type their questions into the uh, chat box, into the Q and A box, and we'll get to those um, in a little while, okay? Sounds great. And thank you for an idea of the questions. I get the flow and what's on your mind. Okay, good. Uh, so um, success strategy. Uh, what, what's the number one um, success strategy you would like to uh, share with everyone here? Well, it's one of the things that isn't intuitively obvious as you come out of school. 
yeah. uh, often in school, uh, uh, you were trained to do things about three to 5% better each year. And that's what success was like in business. Uh, when in fact, uh, what I've focused on is you disrupt or you're going to be disrupted per one of your quotes earlier. And that you've got to have the courage to change before it's obvious you have to change. And so when I look at success factors for uh, which CEOs I invest in, mm -hmm. uh, I look first, have they got a market transition going on enabled by new technology? Right. The second thing I look at is does she or he who is running the company, uh, are they really potentially a world-class leader who wants to be coached and do they match my cultural values? The third thing I look for uh, is their communication skills. And the fourth thing I look for is the value of their culture. And those are really the characteristics that a, a CEO has to have. And that when they shape their strategy and vision for their company, these are the elements that fold into it. So that's what I'd look for in terms of uh, a 30,000 foot view of success factors. Okay. So what would you say has been your busy, biggest success? throughout your career? What was your biggest success? My family. Okay. Uh, Great. I'm very lucky to have two parents who were doctors who did an amazing job of, of uh, I think, raising me and my two sisters. Uh, they taught me about thinking 5, 10, 15 years out. That was dad's strengths. Mom uh, was a psychiatrist, internal medicine, her strengths, emotional IQ, and taught me how to, to really connect with people. Uh, and then my uh, wife and my kids uh, on it. So my family is the, the thing that I'm most proud of in life. Okay. Um, and so since you grew up in West Virginia, uh, Appalachia really, right? Um, do you think that that growing up experience in, you know, outside of New York City or outside of Silicon Valley or outside of one of these coastal hubs mm -hmm. uh, uh, influenced you, impacted the way you developed your career? led you to become a success? I mean, and what kind of lessons did you learn from growing up in West Virginia? All right, well, let me go through those, but let me also uh, answer the question in the way that you, your readership would enjoy my first answer in addition to family. Uh, I think having balance in your life, the okay. business that I clearly love, and also in your family, which should be the most important thing in your life, they go hand in hand. And I always believe family first and customers first and our employees first. Uh, biggest success, uh, obviously taking a company from 70 million sales to 48 billion, uh, becoming the, the most uh, highly valued company in the world at a point in time uh, on it. Acquisition success with a acquiring a company for uh, $92 million that only had 10 million in revenue called Crescendo which we built into a $13 billion engine for switching. And I still am working with five of those leaders today in JC2 after they built $8 billion products for me at Cisco, number one in market share each time. I would say that acquisition was the biggest success on it. And uh, at a company that achieved financial success among the best in the world, but also won every corporate social responsibility award there was to win from Democrats and Republicans, from Obama and uh, Clinton to uh, President Bush and Condi Rice, uh, to the awards in the Middle East and Europe and India and China on uh, giving back because I think the two go together. Uh, so those are kind of the biggest successes. What I'm most proud of out of Cisco, the culture. We weren't a perfect company, but we, we had an amazingly strong culture and we'll probably talk about that more later. Yeah, well, could you describe that a little bit right now? Sure. Well, many people, when we talked earlier about characteristics of a CEO, their, their job is just four things. Strategy and vision for the company, develop, recruit the leadership team, and periodically change them to implement the strategy and vision, culture, and communication of all the above. Mm -hmm. Culture is usually what startups and young CEOs miss, or if they do, they just say, well, we, we know it by intuition because of the time we spend. Culture is what breaks as you scale rapidly. And your companies listening in today that are uh, startups, uh, they, they hit huge stress points at about 100 to 150 people, 500, 1,500, and 5,000. And that's when many of them break. The ones that come through it best are often those that not only have a good strategy and vision, 
but a culture that evolves through these transitions on it. To dovetail into the second part of your, your question that you asked me, uh, how did that shape my growing up in West Virginia? Uh, mm -hmm. And while many people on the broadcast might think, well, Appalachia, it's a very poor section of the country and a lot of, of challenges, growing up, it was not. Uh, we were the chemical center of the world with FMC and DuPont and Carbide and in a town of 75,000 people, 6,000 of the best engineers in the world in the chemical industry were there. And uh, we were the coal mining center of the world, 125,000 coal miners. We had more millionaires in West Virginia than existed in the whole UK. Uh, and uh, we were on top. Uh, my parents taught me to appreciate that and understand the values, uh, but also shaped a large part of my values in life. I often say that if you ever broke down in a car driving through anywhere in the world overnight, and you had to walk up to a strange house in a remote location and ask for help, I'd want for it to be in West Virginia because of the quality of our people and the underlying fabric that they have. I was telling that story and uh, the Dean of Indiana University Business School who's also a good friend and we're getting closer uh, on uh, the school and direction and teaching. She said, John, it's odd that you would say that. She said, I was driving through West Virginia Friday evening after five o'clock, my car broke down, no idea how to help or anything else. Uh, a person from the local service station went back, opened up his operation, brought me in, got the car repaired and sent me on my way. And she said, I don't know if I would have experienced that hardly anywhere else in the world that candidly. So it was a great experience for me. It was outdoors in West Virginia. Uh, a grass number of people were hunters or uh, loved to fish. Uh, grew up swimming in rivers and uh, uh, loving the outdoors and shared that with my dad uh, and my mom. Uh, my mom was a great swimmer, a lifeguard, dancer, athlete, et cetera, on it. And uh, I rose in a very secure environment. However, my parents both taught me to watch trends. And West Virginia began to fall from grace. We kept doing the right thing too long. Yeah. And not only did all the chemical companies disappear, Coal miners went from 125,000 to 20,000, mining the same amount of coal. And because we didn't change as the state, and we had a great education system with West Virginia University and Marshall in the state, but because we didn't change, we got left behind. And now we're number 48 or 49 or 50 uh, yeah. in most categories. And so I realized that you've got to have the courage to change, that government and business and citizens have to work together to change. And to the point that you made earlier, I'm now giving back and partnering with the state, not on transactions like the Virgin Hyperloop, which 17 other states competed for, and we won going away uh, from it and creating hopefully what will be 13,000 jobs, but in transforming the education system at West Virginia University and changing the curriculum to be entrepreneur so people can get jobs and focus on outcomes to doing a startup like Station F and uh, Paris where they do 3000 startups in Station F to Vantage Venture that mentioned earlier in the universities to the support of the governor and the two senators, one Democrat, one Republican on a national level to transform the state to the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate uh, and to the state buying in to we've got to change and we've got to have the courage to become a startup state. So mm -hmm. all my experience, including giving back, uh, were a product of growing up in West Virginia, which I'm very proud to be a part of then and very proud to be a part of now. So that has a label too, doesn't it? West Virginia forward. Um, and that you're hoping- many ways, a startup <laughs> state. Uh, in terms of direction and how do you take advantage of what you can do uniquely. Mm -hmm. And the reason we got the Hyperloop was very simple. We understand uh, building, we understand building railroads and highways. Uh, we understand mechanical engineering challenges in one of the most mountainous parts of our, our country. Uh, because we were a coal mining area, we have assets to many of the rare minerals that you need as you make this description. We were able to mobilize the whole state to go after this. And we went from not even being on their radar to beating out states like Texas and others that went after this in California very mm -hmm. hard. And we won by a huge amount point away. But it was the whole state and all the leaders putting aside their differences and focusing on what was the right outcome we want. 
and so proud to be a part of that. But it was one example of becoming a startup state. Right. Uh, one that's looking forward, not backwards, West Virginia forward. It's the name. Sure. sure. Well, so, you know, it's interesting that you have uh, had this kind of uh, uh, philosophy as well for India and France and helping them develop as startup nations. I'm, I'm curious uh, why India, why France? Well, uh, I believe first that startups, as we alluded to earlier, where all job creation is going to come. Uh, in talking to large companies, and I did several of them today, and when I said large companies in total, because of automation, digitization, and AI, with not any headcount over the next decade, <laughs> they all agreed uh, in total. And it says if you're trying to create 25 million jobs in the next decade in this country, uh, about 10 million jobs in France, and 1.2 million jobs per month in India, wow. uh, if you don't have a startup engine, you don't have a future. Uh, and uh, in Europe, uh, as I looked for a strategic partner to digitize while I was still at Cisco, digital countries I believed in, I thought it was going to be the UK. But the UK was in a period that you led up to the BRICS exit uh, uh, series where their leaders were not in power very long. And for a combination of reasons, the sustainability of a program wasn't there. I then thought it would be Germany. Uh, but the leaders in Germany and the chancellor uh, viewed that they were okay, that they were in good shape, and uh, uh, they'd meet on these topics every six months. <laughs> and I didn't say anything, but my head about hit the table. You know, this, this is something that's changing with tremendous speed. In France, where deservedly so as being one of the worst places to do business, especially for a startup, a very socialistic country uh, that really did not value entrepreneurism, et cetera, Boy, was I wrong. There was leaders there that President Alone started, but uh, President Macron, who I got to know when he was economic minister, he grasped the importance of a startup attitude for job creation, grasped the country hadn't changed. I actually had the chance to jointly teach MBA school classes with him uh, and handle the questions for the students and uh, watch the transition that was occurring. So very simply, I bet on the country that was willing to change. Now, before people say these dreams can't happen and West Virginia is stretched too far, France, when we started, had not had an increase in startups for decades, venture capital back. And it was known as a terrible place to put your employees. Mm -hmm. Today, it is the number one startup engine for all of Europe. Uh, and startups have increased fivefold since five years ago, fivefold. They have many unicorns and on the way to having more. And they're known more and more as the innovation gateway to Europe with one of, if not, in my opinion, the top leader in Europe. India was the same, but with a little bit different spin. Uh, not 70 million people or 350 million people, but 1.3 billion. A country whose IIT university systems uh, were amazing. Think of Stanford, MIT, Carnegie Mellon, times five uh, in terms of the top schools, graduating 600,000 engineers a year. Uh, and when you top 2% of your population goes into engineering school, you have great schools, guess what happens? You've got unbelievable engineering power. But the country had never lived up to its potential in the sense that they were always a slow follower. A great place to outsource work, uh -huh. but not a great place to do startups and do innovation. And when Prime Minister Modi came in, I had the chance to be chairman of US India Strategic Partnership Forum. And that was a forum that Henry Kissinger created almost 45 years ago, the, lay, uh, the secretary, prior Secretary of State uh, many years ago. And I, I took it with my team from being a trade organization to the most strategic partnership between two countries that could influence the lives, not just of big businesses, but small businesses and the citizens in each country, a dream that was uh, almost unobtainable. And, but I did it because I believed in Prime Minister Modi, just like I believed in President Macron. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is one of the top three leaders I've ever met in my life. And I've met them all over 40 years uh, uh, in the CEO or close to that leadership area. He does his own digital strategy for his country, a digital India. He dreams and then he spares hope and he does it on inclusion and then he makes it happen. 
And so it's fun uh, being part of that, but it's the same thing. It's how do you generate jobs around the world? It's how do you do inclusion based upon geographic issues, gender issue, religion, color of your skin, et cetera, in terms of the direction. And so it's a model that when the US takes it for granted that we are a startup nation, we are not anymore. Silicon Valley is already in trouble. Uh, yeah. If you don't change, we'll go to the root of Boston 128. If yeah. I were a young startup, I'd go to Texas today as opposed to Silicon Valley. So I've learned if you don't change, you get left behind. And I've also learned that if you have the courage to dream, a power of great education, and the access to resources, you can build a great company wherever you are in the world. So that's what I'm doing in those two countries, role models. That's what I'm doing in West Virginia. Why do you think Silicon Valley is, Pete? Well, is it cost of living issues? Is it uh, we're just resting on our laurels? We've been tops for so long that we don't need to try so hard anymore. What, what is it? Is uh, it China? <laughs> it's uh, uh, assuming that if you continue to do the same thing, you'll get the same results, which is wrong. Uh, uh -huh. It's uh, a state that have forgot how we got on top. Yeah. Uh, a state that used to pride itself in being pro-business, pro-job creation, pro-inclusion. Yeah. And it's one now that regulation is the number one issue businesses face here in California. Uh, and regulation on every front from privacy to uh, how you grow your company uh, to uh, a tax environment that is unsustainable both for companies and for employees. Texas has zero state taxes. Mm -hmm. California is moving to 16 and a half percent. How do you compete against that? Yeah. And it's one whose regulations that caused us not to build out the infrastructure, the houses that are needed for the future on it. And uh, when the large companies started to leave like Hewlett Packard and, and Charles Schwab, Hewlett Packard was the original garage startup in Silicon Valley. Yeah. And nobody panicked. There wasn't anybody saying, what are we doing wrong? We've got to fix this. Right. And Charles Schwab left. He was the original financial startup with the new images and ideas. Yeah. And then you have Elon Musk, who one of the top business generation leaders, richest man in the world at the present time, with Tesla's going to Texas. And you have startups like Palantir moving to other states and venture capital moving out. And still nobody understands what's happening. Using a West Virginia term, we're like frogs. Uh, you put a frog in a pot and you slowly turn up the water, you can cook the frog. You throw a frog in a pot of hot water and they jump right out. Uh, we have become overconfident, bordering on arrogance that this will just continue and it will not. And it's really hard to regain once you lose it. Boston 128 never came back. Yeah. Not just the tech center of the world, but never the computer technology center again. West Virginia, we're going to see if we can come back, but it was a 40 year, two generation challenge for all of our people because we didn't change. So I think the issues in California are largely self inflicted. Uh, that includes our forest fires, which we spend 95% of our money on fighting the fire, as opposed to saying, how do you prevent it? How do you do the proper cleaning that is required. The fairs have been out here in California since the beginning of time. Uh, but yet we have not learned how to balance it. We can't keep our lights on uh, at times we yeah. have brownouts. Uh, so business is going to go where they're wanted. Uh, I have a startup that uh, out of uh, New York, a uh, company called ASAP, uh, artificial intelligence, amazing company. And uh, I uh, headed up by an individual by the name of Gustavo, wicked smart, uh, growing at hundreds of percent per year. They have 50 PhDs of artificial intelligence uh, in their company. The whole MIT graduating class of last year joined their company, all four of them. Uh, and they can compete against the Google and the Facebooks of the world, uh, the Microsoft, very, very easy. Uh, and yet... They are now, the CEO is living in Montana as is a fair number of his senior staff. And the governor of Montana calls him at least twice a month saying, what do we need to do to keep you and expand you here? You've seen how the governor of Texas uh, recruits companies from California and focuses on it. Uh, while our leadership 
isn't trying to attract companies here, doesn't even seem to be bothered when they leave, and doesn't even ask the question, could we keep you or what would it take to keep your peers and unwilling to make the changes? So that is overconfidence. And it's, it's why I believe we, we either change or we'll get left behind uh, on it. Right, right. So nationally, are you concerned about the U.S. falling behind? Big time. Uh, if you look at the high tech startups, and remember everybody listening to your, uh, your podcast today uh, needs to understand that every startup in the future will have a large technology digitization component part to it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, you won't survive. It doesn't matter if you're in travel and leisure or manufacturing or sales or uh, uh, health care. Uh, any of the areas have, will have a huge amount of technology embedded. In the top 20 areas, when the U.S. defense organizations ranked our high-tech leadership versus China and high-tech leadership on areas from silicon capabilities, et cetera, on, uh, China was ahead of the U.S. in 15 of the 20. We don't realize we are no longer the leader. And we don't seem as concerned as we need to be. I would love to see the new administration saying we will become a startup nation again. Let's revitalize our startup engine. Let's generate the best jobs for the most people with the highest standard of living. And there's a role model to see that too. Uh, uh, during the 90s, President Clinton was the one president during my lifetime who grasped the power of new technology trends, i.e. the internet, and leveraged those very, very strongly. And I'm a moderate Republican, so not a natural supporter, but boy, he got it. And uh, he generated 22 and a half million jobs in eight years, 34% growth in GDP. The last time America uniformly got a raise, the average per capita household went up 30, 24% in eight years on earnings. I think we have that opportunity in front of us again with digitization and AI and the internet of things and 5G, but only if the government has the courage to move and the business community to partner with them and the VCs and the citizens want to create an environment where our children can have these type of jobs and where we can have a job if we're senior as well in terms of the future. Well, of the countries that are competing with the US for leadership, how would you rank China? At the very top of the list. Okay, followed lots by- Lots of weaknesses, but lots of strengths. Lots of weaknesses, but lots of strengths. Okay, can you elaborate? Sure. I've been in China for uh, over uh, 35 years. I did the first high-tech venture capital move in China at Wang Laboratories uh, in terms of joint ventures. Uh, we took outsourcing of high-tech manufacturing to China, partnered with Zhang Zemin, the president there. I met with him. Average meeting was over an hour. We created a win-win. And for 20 years, they were a great partner. Tough negotiators were a great partner. China, unfortunately, now it's a win-lose. Uh, in the U.S., uh, uh, they're being very direct. They, they want to see us lose. They don't create a level playing field for American businesses in China, and yet they want the Chinese companies in America to have the same, same access to our markets in total. So that's a, a real challenge for us. However, what they do do well, and I've lost track of the number. I think it's the 14th five-year plan. Uh, but each of the five-year plans, they outline their goals to the next five years. They set a goal yeah. to break away from the US. They set a goal of technology leadership in many areas. They set a goal of standard living for their citizens and they executed very well off of it uh, in terms of the approach. But again, it was something they understood the importance of, built the education system to do it and drove it through, even with all their weaknesses of a dictatorial society, uh, a, uh, uh, an environment that uh, does not protect intellectual property, et cetera. So they are going to become the top economy in the world. I think that is going to happen, period. Uh, I personally think the US and China should work together as opposed to be in conflict, uh, but you've got to create win-win on both sides. So they've done the best job. Now, I bet on China in 1995 at a time that almost no other business and technology leaders did. That's where India is today. I bet on India as my second world headquarters in Cisco. I bet on India in terms of becoming the startup nation first in Asia and then beyond. I bet on Prime Minister Modi's vision his first five years to ensure India's strength for the next five, which he did. And now he's in his second five-year term to ensure India's success for the next 25 years. 
and their movement in terms of this view, et cetera. I think they will have the fastest growing startup uh, standard of living increase in all of Asia for their citizens. And they need to generate with a population 1.3 billion, average age 26 years old, 1.2 million jobs per month to do this. And they have a vision on how they're gonna go after. If our betting in one country competitive wise in Europe, and I think Europe is challenged uh, even more than the US is, it would clearly be France. And mm -hmm. I think the changes they're making, there are no guarantees. And remember, while many people lost track that that uh, France invented the word entrepreneur, uh, <laughs> they'd lost track of that. Uh, and getting it back and changing a country and a culture is hard to do. Their progress has been good, but not without resistance. And we'll see how they do over this next five years. Right, so at JC2 Ventures, you have two of your startups are in India. So maybe yes. you can talk a little bit about those uh, two Indian companies. Well, if I were going to be the advisor to uh, Prime Minister Modi in India, uh, I felt that I couldn't do it without literally both making personal time investment but also understanding the startups and what is working and not working in that environment. And so I picked uh, one startup and then grew to two. Uh, I had my pick of the litter uh, and uh, uh, I got to see the top eight startups that MIT selected as the hottest startups in India. And I met with their leaders and one, Unifor with the mesh, who's the CEO of it, uh, it turned out to be uh, just amazing and we talked many times and then I decided I wanted to advise him and invest in it. He's now moved his company headquarters to the US and I think you're gonna see a, a 20X uh, return for the shareholders uh, as we look out over the next couple of years. But more importantly, they have the chance to lead all of artificial intelligence and the customer uh, call center environment around artificial uh, you know, language capability in terms of, of artificial intelligence applied to conversation. And then they just acquired a company that got announced today about uh, using artificial intelligence for video and facial capability. So you can tell okay. when I talk to you, you like what I'm saying, not how do you use this in healthcare with your doctor? How do you use it in call centers? For the call center agent to realize the person calling in is, is really upset with you, you're not giving him or her the answers you need, etc. And so that one's off and running, doing great, built a very good diverse team uh, on gender and geography on it, about 30% of the business in the US, very good growth on the total international basis. The other company, uh, classic, uh, Saket Modi, uh, not related to the prime minister, uh, 28 years old, more energy than almost anybody I've ever seen in life. And very few people can keep up with me. And I'm not sure if that's a strength or a weakness, but he can and more. Uh, he's boundless energy, but he's very coachable. And uh, he basically uh, focused on uh, cybersecurity and how do you know if your environment is secure? And more importantly, how do you know where the weaknesses are and how do you rate that versus others? And if you made changes, how would you improve that rating? So on a simple scale of one to five, where is your company or where is you as a consumer? And then more importantly, how do you explode that down to individual elements throughout the company? And then where you have weaknesses, uh, what will you do to change those? So if you spend the money, you know if you're gonna get the improvement or not, and you have something that leaders understand where today being very candid in a boardroom, uh, you really bet your future on your chief security officer who's gonna show you all the matrix they're doing and things of that type, but it's really your belief with them saying, here's what I'm doing that you're betting on. Uh, yes. it, it, it isn't a way that you can say, well, how do I compare to another company? And how does that other company compare to their peers? You right. don't have that standard. Or if I invest $10 million on changing what you just recommended, how will I know that I, I got improvement back? And so it addresses a pretty simple issue uh, with one that is kind of exciting to do. The fun part is India's moved from no unicorns to approximately 30 in the pipeline. And uh, the growth has been fun to do uh, yeah. on, in terms of pipeline. You're seeing similar movement in France. Uh, they just had two unicorns a year ago. Uh, watch how many they have five years from now. Right. So, and you're you're trying to get some of these unicorns, two more of them, in, in fact, in your portfolio. But I'm, I'm curious too about how you select your startups to invest in. What do you have a, a like a list of things that you go through, or is it kind of emotional, instinctual? Uh, tell us about how you select the companies. Sure, it's my honor. Um, 
my my strengths and limitations are are similar. Uh, I will watch for pattern recognition. We okay. talked about patterns. One twenty eight startups, West Virginia, France, Silicon Valley. Uh, on it, I get market transitions right. I.e., what happened to West Virginia when there were fundamental changes in the chemical industry and in the coal industry. Uh, on it. So the first thing I look at is a industry that is going to go through a major market transition enabled by new technology, one that everybody on this uh, podcast would clearly grasp uh, what Amazon did using the power of the internet to completely transform retail. Mm -hmm. And so I watch for a business model change like in customer experience in call centers enabled by new AI or in security uh, the ability to think about a security with voice uh, capability being your primary way of determining uh, who you're dealing with, et cetera, on it. The second thing I look at is the CEO. And as we alluded to earlier, uh, it's based upon the skill she or he has and the drive that they have and do they share common values and the strategy they have, is it differentiatable? Then candidly, I go straight to the, their customers. And rather than them tell me how happy the customers are, I ask the customers. And I always require them to give me feedback. What does the customer like or not like? And then I go check to see if that's true. And then I ask the customers, do you think this, this company, this leader is a game changer on it? And at Cisco, out of all my large acquisitions, 180 of them, all of them are tied to customers tell me directly or indirectly, I should buy this company. Then I try to pick how close they are to the inflection point. My skills are in scaling, driving culture, dealing with problems as you grow rapidly. And so I try to pick them one to two years ahead of an inflection point uh, and then help them navigate through that and grow through it with rapid type of growth uh, overall. And so those are the fundamental things that I, I evaluate in looking at the company. Do they have a sustainable differentiation uh, that they can maintain, et cetera? Well, how can, how can you identify these market transitions in advance? Um, is this... Uh, a particular skill that you've developed? Well, you can, you can call it a skill or intuition. I think it's pattern recognition. Okay. Uh, it's having seen the market transitions in West Virginia or in mainframes when I was at IBM and they lost the leadership when many computers came out to DEC and Data General and Wang. And yeah. then the many computers had lost it to the client server uh, when Microsoft and Intel came out and IBM with these products. And then with them watching it, losing it to the internet and the internet losing the transition to cloud, uh, et cetera. So I've watched how this occurs. And it's rare that a company leads in their area of expertise into a new generation of the expertise. Mm -hmm. We'll see if Amazon can move from the cloud to the cloud at the edge and intelligence at the edge or not. And I'd give it less than 50, 50 odds it will. Uh, and uh, it is the ability to constantly gather data. If you watch when you and I talked the other day, I listened to what you were saying in many areas, whether it was talking about West Virginia, your experience there, your travels, or some of the uh, startups that we talked about and how you responded. And when I see several people respond the same way to an issue, then I pick the opportunity to go after it. So I'll use two of my more recent uh, acquisitions as, as uh, acquisition, 40 and slip. Two of my more recent investments uh, that I've just made in the last six months. Uh, the supply chain is broken. Uh, supply chain is more of a, a, uh, a point in time generation of where things are, uh, much like it was done 20 years ago, led by companies that developed their products 20 years ago. Supply chain today has to be real time, capable of seeing exactly where you are at any point in time and understanding all the elements. Is it in motion, the temperature, et cetera, requirements of this that allow you to deliver effective supply chain management and plan for it? One that every one of your listeners will understand delivering the COVID vaccine, vaccine is an example. You've got to know how many vaccines do you have? Where are they? Are they in motion? What is their temperature? How close are they to expiration? Where are the locations where they are? What can be shared? Sounds simple, really hard to do. Yet that's what CloudLeaf does. And it's a small startup that is really starting to break away in its product category. We'll see if it is as strong as I hope. I really like, again, the CEO. I like the vision of 
the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and real-time capability, censoring capability, if you will, tied to the market transition across all industries. I like the CEO a lot uh, in terms of where he's doing. The customers I talk to love their vision, betting big time on the company, and I felt that it was in a market transition. Uh, I think that is occurring. Uh, one that I just invested in this last week, uh, a company called Versec, and in the security space. And most of security is designed not to let you in. And it's almost like a, a, a an interrogation of, you know, you're calling into my call center, or I'm worried about, are you the right user? Or how do you prevent information from getting in uh, in a very tough way? What Versec does is focus on the application workloads throughout the whole of the enterprise. And so the solar winds issue that you saw that hit some of the, the top companies and government agencies in America, they completely prevented and they're installed accounts. And so you're talking about a company that is in transition, enabled by a different approach to cybersecurity and thinking about it as it moves throughout the company from the clouds, et cetera, in terms of an architecture. Uh, again, classic CEO. This one happened to be very unique. Uh, I've acquired two of these companies when they, uh, they were sold to Cisco. So I already uh, knew he was really good and his track record had been very good. But uh, we came together in terms of the transition. How could I help him grow and scale? And uh, how could he solve a security problem, which literally as we were completing the deal, uh, SolarWinds uh, uh, hack occurred and it made it very easy on the decision. Wow. So one of the things with your pattern recognition, and I picked this up from your book of being able to go from A to B to Z. Can you talk about that? This pattern recognition, A to B to Z, how you're able to do that? Well, it's, it's practice. It's having seen it before. Most traditional thinkers go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, more of a process approach. I'm dyslexic. And uh, uh, if you ask me to look things up in an old phone book, I would get lost because I transpose letters. Uh, I had a teacher, Mrs. Anderson, spatial education in West Virginia before they understood dyslexia, but she worked with me after school for three years to teach me how to read differently, how to think differently on it. And what I learned is if I can visualize it, I can do it. So okay. if you give me a list, uh, Rebecca, in terms of uh, here's the turn you make, here's the next turn, here's your next turn, here's your next turn, here's your next turn, I will get lost. If I visualize the turns, picture the map, I go from A to Z and I know how to get there. So I take a weakness and make it a strength. If you talk to dyslexics, whether it's somebody in your family or your children, often on panels, we can finish each other's sentences. Uh, it is a severe problem, but one that's not only manageable, but you can actually make a strength. Probably 30% of the world's leaders are dyslexic. Almost none of them were meant to it. And the reason I know the numbers, I do ask people like Charles Schwab and Richard Branson, are you? Uh, and But I also recognize the pattern of the thinking. It's easy to see. Oh, that, that's uh, really fascinating. Boom, boom. But what I also do is gather data constantly. And when I see a, a confluence of the data, uh, then it's easy for me to project the pattern recognition for the outcome. So that's how I think about it uh, overall. Make a weakness, try to make it a strength. Uh, don't think you're going to be smarter than everybody else. Don't think you can continue to run the same play they've been running for so long and be better. You've got to say, what's the transition? How are you going to approach it differently? Sure. Uh, how do you see around corners to make this happen? So this allows you to get to the big picture uh, probably more quickly, right? I had no choice but to get there quicker. Uh, <laughs> because if I went traditionally, I got lost. Okay. Or I got lost, I make the same wrong turn again and again. And I wouldn't oh. have the patience to do it that way. Oh, wow, well, that's great. Well, so, um, well, since you have kind of this crystal ball, this unique crystal ball skill, are there any sectors that you would like to avoid right now investing in? Are there any particular sectors that you're avoiding that they're okay. oversaturated? Well, I, crystal ball, I would call, call it more what it is. I get market transitions right. I listen hard. I bounce the ideas off of it. I do pattern recognition, I do verification, and I'm willing to take risks knowing that a certain number of my investments will fail, just like my acquisitions did. Now, I know I'm going to get beat up for the few that fail much more than I'll ever be congratulated on the successes. That's okay. That's, that's part of portfolio management. Areas that I'm careful on right now, lessons learned for your audience. Uh, if a company is focusing 
on something that many other people are already doing and they really don't have sustainable differentiation, don't do the company and don't invest. Uh, other things, uh, you've got to have a unique balance between strategy and vision and execution. And many people who are good on strategy and vision aren't as operationally inclined. Get people around you who complement the weaknesses you have mm -hmm. in terms of the direction. Third, every company becomes a digital company. We all understand that, right? Right. Well, your strategy on your company better have a large part of technology and digital bit into it, or you're not going to differentiate. And then be able to articulate and understand, do you really have differentiation in the market? Or are you really a me too? And a me too, uh, first of all, nobody remembers number six or seven. And secondly, six or seven don't usually survive for very long in terms of the market. Uh, I avoid areas that I do not have expertise in. Uh, as you said on FIP, I got my head handed to me by Apple and I wasn't smart enough to outmaneuver it. I'm not as good in consumer in part because I don't know how to ask the consumer what they need or what problem they're trying to solve or who do I listen to as the consumer. I know how to do that really well in, in enterprise to enterprise sales. And so I go listen in terms of it. And that's mistakes often make. Uh, culture, I talked about how important it is for those of you in the business, next staff meeting you're in, whether you're the CEO or just a member of the team, before anybody does anything else, get out a pad of paper and write down what is your culture and what are your top five cultural values. Don't share. Then pass them in the middle, maybe without your name even being on it and see how close you all were together. It will surprise and probably disappoint you. Uh, if you believe culture is your roadmap to achieving greatness and you never have great companies without great cultures, you may like the culture at Microsoft or Amazon or Google or Oracle or Cisco or JP Morgan Chase or Bank of America, you may not. Company has unbelievably strong cultures in terms of direction. And uh, for me, being customer driven is a critical mistake many companies make. When I don't understand something, and intellectually, I, I'm not able to solve it. Uh, I, I stay away from it. Cryptocurrency, especially Bitcoins. But you know, it, it, it isn't there yet. Uh -huh. And unless you're going to do something different here, you're going to see unbelievable wild gyrations in it, which you just saw what a 20% a change in the value in the last two days uh, on it. Yeah. So I stay away from things I don't understand. I know that my weakness could be, and the weakness of my CEOs also could be, because you're smart in one area, you just assume that that smartness carries over to another area. Every really world-class CEO with an engineering background I've ever seen almost messes up entirely who they select as their head of sales. Because they get somebody that talks like an engineer, uh, somebody <laughs> that is very analytical and step-by-step. -step. Yeah, uh, somebody who doesn't understand the emotional sell, uh, yeah. somebody who uh, thinks logic always wins. Best product doesn't always win. Best sales team usually wins. Uh, if you combine best product and best sales team, you do. Uh, the engineers usually hire uh, a very good business development person as opposed to a, a CRO lead. Same yeah. thing's true of the business leads. They don't know how to recruit a world-class engineer. They recruit somebody who thinks in business terms, not technology terms, and how do you do it? So know what you know and know what you don't and assume just because you're good in one area, it does not mean at all that you're going to be good in another area. That's overconfidence, boarding on arrogance, and it will get you into real trouble. Okay, so what are the top areas that you invest in? Uh, the hottest three. thing for me is artificial intelligence. Okay. Uh, anything that do, does with Larry and that, uh, probably a dozen of the companies have large elements of artificial intelligence or what yeah. I do. Uh, I love the customer interface. So you're going to see me all over customer interface capabilities, uh, often starting in the call center or support areas, how companies interface to their customers, then expanding on it. I love the concept of the cloud moving to the edge. This is a chance to challenge the, the Bahamas, the the monopolies of the world like Amazon uh, in terms of the direction. And if 75% of the data and the applications, the process will occur at the edge of the network, i.e. like driving this cars, uh, operations of branch, majority of this data will not come back structured or unstructured to a central cloud or vision. That's gonna allow for new opportunities uh, in terms of the direction. I love cybersecurity uh, because uh, if you're a digital world and everything's automated, 
that's where the bad guys are going to go, whether it's organized crime, whether it's rogue nation states, uh, whether it's violations of privacy uh, issues, et cetera, uh, on it. And so how do you approach this architecturally? I have eight companies in uh, the cybersecurity area, ranging from voice recognition, like a pin drop does for the call centers, uh, to the ability to, we talked about the rating of cybersecurity uh, out of uh, uh, SAFE, i.e. Lucidius Mo uh, Saket Modi's company in India, to the only secure mobile phone in the world where you take your Apple or your Android phone and you slide it into a safe case, which itself is a platform and a computer. It's the only one that the Department of Defense in the US recognizes as being secure. They're winning all the bids so far so sourced because there isn't a really good alternative to it. And then I love when you've got markets in transition like supply chain and understanding that that's going to occur and having lived through supply chain problems, not knowing where your components are, what is the impact of this one plant being shut down because of an earthquake or political unrest? Uh, what are the implications about where are you? When will it arrive? As you begin to get much more sensitive about time, uh, uh, temperatures, uh, building into that real-time ability to do modeling, uh, it was clearly set up for a transition, uh, hence the uh, investment in cloud leaf. And then I love changing the world one more time, not just creating jobs. Uh, and my startups, quote, being partnering with India, or France or West Virginia or Texas uh, in terms of the direction, but solving world problems on climate uh, or world problems as it relates to uh, hunger and where insects can for probably 80 or 90% of the world uh, be what only uh, uh, is your primary consumption of protein a decade from now. And there's a good chance it may get there, but it could also solve world hunger. And it's the cleanest form of protein you can generate with the least impact on the environment. One tenth of what uh, you do with uh, uh, animals that you raise meat yeah. from and a much lower fraction of what you can do from agriculture. So I'm a dreamer. I'm a dreamer that I'd love to, to share and, and dream with the people who listen to this podcast about how do they dream. And then oh, no. dreams only come true if you have operational skills and learn from others on mistakes and successes they have. Right. Is there a particular company or and or entrepreneur that you look up to? There have been many over the years. If I kind of go through ones on my mind and execution of it, um, I think of a person by the name of Shimon Perez sure. that was the startup engine for Israel, first in defense then startups, and then in peace. And he did it again and again, Rebecca. And he had a curiosity at 93 years of age that I've never seen. Uh, he came to my house at the time that there was conflict between Israel and Iran, and there was rumors they were going to strike him uh, in their nuclear uh, power development yeah. uh, because they were concerned about nuclear weapons. And when he came, I had seven SWAT teams all over this place from different countries, different agencies, people on the roofs, dogs everywhere. I looked up one night in preparation, the park behind us looked like a scene from ET with lights going everywhere. They were doing their drills. Uh, he had to sit in the location for the dinner that was least likely to be able to be shot from a long distance off. Uh, on it, we had the top venture capital companies and startups and, and uh, political leader from Israel. And he was the most relaxed person I've ever seen. His team made me promise not to let him leave the dining area and the living room for security reasons. And uh, halfway through the night, he said, John, I understand you got an electrical car. I said, yes, sir, I do. It's a Fisker. It, it, it's not going to be a financial success, but it is beautiful. And he said, I'd like to see it. I said, Mr. President, your security team said you could not leave these two locations. He said, John, I am the president. Let's go. All right. We started to the elevator. Here we are with police cars, military trains, SWAT teams everywhere. Nobody had done scenario planning. What happens if we take off on a, a ride in my car? And so everybody is scrambling. And then his chief of staff came over and said, John, he's asking you to drive the car. 
you need to know he has not got a driver's license and hasn't driven for over 10 years. And I go, this is really going to be interesting. <laughs> and we go down into the garage. He looks at the car. He asks a bunch of questions on it. He said, do you mind if I get in? And, and I said, of course not. And he went over the driver's seat. And I said, do you mind if I ride with you? He said, let's do it. He shut the door. We went through the things. The garage door went up. Everybody was panicking. He got a smile on his face and said, that's what I wanted to know. Turned off the engine. We went back upstairs. He was the most curious entrepreneur I've ever met. He taught me to think like a teenager. He taught me how lonely leadership was, really lonely, and what it was like during the periods of loner. But right. he, he literally constantly reinvented himself and his country and direction. So that's probably maybe the person that I look up to the most. I love what Modi's doing in India. He is reinventing a country at tremendous speed with democratic principles and inclusion and the strengths and limitations of a democracy in terms of speed of movement on it. Uh, if you look in the industry, uh, I love what LinkedIn's done in social media, uh, navigating many of the issues that other companies have really struggled with and becoming part of a Microsoft in a very effective way in terms of the direction. I love what Netflix has done uh, in terms of a different culture than I would have but an amazing transformation of a company and industry, a Comcast, uh, what they are in a service provider, they literally are a technology company, digitization content, and they constantly reinvent themselves and are a great place to work on it. I love what Jack Welch did as a prior business leader. He was tough, but he was clearly the best business leader in the generation that went in front of me. Uh, so I learned from many people in many different ways. President Clinton described what technology could do for the state of a, a country. And when he asked me to speak on technology at the time he announced America's competitive leadership uh, in the internet at his cycle with President Clinton on one side of the podium and Vice President Bush on the other. And I was scared to death. A young entrepreneur <laughs> was still wondering, what am I doing here? And I knew that he, he always talked off the cuff and talked without notes. So I was determined also, I'm dyslexic, so reading might have been a problem not to have notes and talk off the cuff. And as we're cuff, and as we're going up there, I looked down. I said, Mr. President, you've got notes. He said, yeah, this is really a hard topic, John. I'm going to use notes this time. I went, oh. <laughs> but he was probably one of the most curious technology leaders, understood how it can change society. So lots of people that I really admire. Uh, uh, George Bush. Uh, you know, people have different views. I personally really believe an amazing man. I saw him right after 9-11. He invited me to the Rose Garden to discuss the infrastructure implications, et cetera, uh, that were occurring. And this was the time nobody was going to Washington and, and people were locking down and, and there were worries about series of secondary attacks, et cetera. He was the most calm person in the Capitol. Most calm person, I would argue, actually he was at his very best under the crisis. Uh, for him there. So lots of leaders and people that I admire in different categories. Uh, I have, I'm, I've skipped many. My dad and mom uh, admire tremendously on what they did. Maybe my two best role models. Okay, so at Cisco, you were uh, often globetrotting, traveling the world, um, one country to the next. And now, well, of course, with COVID, now we're not traveling. But as a VC now, are you missing these kind of world travels and is there some incident you can share from your world travels that you know really made a huge impact on you? Well, uh, do I miss the travel itself? No. Do I miss the different customers, the people getting to data mine, if you will, pattern recognized based upon being in groups? I miss that tremendously. Having said that, I will never travel at most a quarter to a third of what I used to. I've learned how to do the same thing through sessions like this. And I've learned because we invented telepresence video at Cisco for business after the bird flu epidemic in Mexico, where I was there the day it broke out and it was with the president of Mexico and they couldn't even bring their leaders together because they were worried about how contagious they thought it would be and the death rates. Fortunately, it turned out to not be anywhere near as serious as we thought but I realized then you've got to have the capability to communicate for both efficiencies, but perhaps also for safety reasons uh, over video capability. And that was 2006 uh, on it. And uh, 
uh, learning how to change and have the vision to catch transitions and really change as you go forward. So those are kind of the, the thoughts that I have at this time. Okay, how do you organize your time? Do you have a, a roadmap? I do. Like every week, every day, every hour? How, how do you organize your time? Well, I'm a, a pattern recognition person, but also a pattern person. I love to exercise if I can four or five days a week minimum, either swim okay. or run. I try to do that as much as I can. I also love to eat. So if I don't do it, the, the results are bad. Uh, and I run proportionally how far I run to how guilty I am based on what the skills are telling me. Uh, but I do get into similar patterns. Uh, you wake up each day, I pop out of bed. Uh, my pupils are dilated, excited about the world. Uh, uh, and my parents taught me deal with the world the way it is, not the way you wish it was. They were doctors. That really helps you deal with the challenges in life and focus on the positives. I take a share uh, and I think of my whole day, what I wanna do. I have it planned out. Here's my meeting agenda for a typical day, printed out in detail. I have the books behind it, even though there are only five people in the company, write-ups in every session, including yours, most likely questions. I have them all memorized. Uh, I then uh, uh, start off with a series of meetings, which because of Zoom, unfortunately, <laughs> I can now start at five in the morning or six in the morning or at seven in the morning and go to late in the evening on it. And I do eight to 15 video sessions a day overall. I write out, which I'd suggest every person listen to your podcast, how do I think I should spend my time? And then I track it, not with tremendous detail, but general detail, how do I actually? How much time do I think I should spend with my startups? How much time should I spend with the leadership development? How much time should I spend uh, in terms of uh, key position in the industry with media, et cetera? How much do I wanna spend giving back? Uh, how much do I want to spend developing what the JC2 structure looks like and evaluating other companies? And then I track it. And let me tell you, you're going to be disappointed. First, you should absolutely say, where should you spend your time and then track it and then constantly adjust because you tend to go to either what is a problem or you tend to go to what you enjoy. And that's not what leadership's about. You've got to say, what is the blend? Because your most valuable resource you have as a leader, especially in a startup environment, is your own time. And so doing that very structured becomes key. And contrary to what a couple of you might think, and by the way, I thought this too, John, that sounds like bureaucracy. That just slows you down. It allows me to go at speeds that others cannot. I could get an idea unsolicited on a Thursday night at Cisco, call from the head of NASDAQ saying, John, you're an idiot. And Bob was a very good friend. I said, I know that, but what did I do wrong now? And he said, there's a company that everybody knows is about to get acquired, common knowledge, private company, and you aren't even in there and your competitors are going to take it and it's perfect for you. And I said, Bob, what is it? And he named the company. I didn't even know who they were. And I, but he said, here's the name of the CEO. You can give him a call. I did. I set up a meeting with my head of business development the next morning at 7.30 with him. My business development leader went over there. He did, good news was he didn't know the company either. <laughs> he went over, so I didn't feel quite as embarrassed. Uh, he met with him for an hour and a half. He called me on the phone. He said, John, you get to hear over here. I went over. I sat down. Uh, I realized the company vision, strategy, perfect for us, where we were going. I did a handshake for a $3 million acquisition. Uh, I called up my board and informed them of the decision I wanted to make, but told them I'd already made the commitment. Uh, so it's a problem for me if we back out. Uh, we uh, put it through both boards of directors, had our HR people in, did the contracts with all the key employees, uh, position plan for the market, position plan for their customers, et cetera, announced Monday morning and off and running. And fortunately, it turned out to be a success. Wow. That was process. It wasn't creativity. We had a replicatable process that we could run at a speed that no one else could. And we did it again and again. Wow. That's impressive. That's my number one lesson from today's session. Um, and uh, I love that. Uh, so let me think, uh, let me think about bringing in some other um, voices here. Sure. And um, I got to put on my glasses to see who's uh, on the Q&A and who's on the chat. Okay. All right. So chat. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, someone wants to know if you're interested in nanotechnology or robotics. 
I'm interested in both. Uh, I don't have as much expertise in nanotechnology and I did robotics in an area with drones that is my one miss that I've had as a high tech investor uh, with building drones, et cetera. And candidly, I got in the market transition with China, with DJI building drones and volume and we were building them for a specific application area. So it's fascinating to me. It's part of digitization and sensors everywhere, uh, but I do not have investments in either categories at this time in terms of actually building them. Okay. And uh, they want to know what about Genentech? Are you uh, an admirer of Genentech and what they're doing? I am, but I'm not as familiar with the detail as the person asking the question. My overall impression is is, 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 is positive on it, but it goes back to that's track record, uh, relationships and trust. Okay, let's see, Q and A here. Um, all right, thank you, thank you. Thank you, for, thank you everyone for listening. Um, okay, greetings from Hong Kong. Happy to see you here. I used to work for Cisco at your time. Um, how do you see the innovation of networking and semiconductor development in Western uh, and Asia? Would open innovation and acquisition continue for the model for large corporate move forward? So, okay. uh, so uh, very much admire what's going on in Asia. You're seeing tremendous movement and candidly, uh, a lot of the major fabrication plants are now in Taiwan and uh, in Ch mainland China. Uh, in terms of large companies acquiring, that's actually going to accelerate in all industries. There's a tremendous amount of cash available in the market. This is where the Fed and fisc fiscal uh, policies have really done very well in this country and around the world. Uh, that if you look at uh, that, that will actually increase. And driven by that in part is large companies no longer think 10 years out. Uh, they are not able to attract the same talent. The majority of students come out of Stanford or uh, Polytechnique in, in France, the top engineering school there, or the IITs in India. They want to go to work for a startup, not for a big company. And startups by their nature think five and 10 years out. Companies we talked about today on average will be 10 years before they get an exit, either being acquired or IPO for successful uh, on it. And so uh, you're now finding the innovation is done a lot by startups. And I talked to three large enterprise companies today. All three of them were looking at how they partner with JC2 portfolio companies to provide innovation to them, whether it's in AI, security, et cetera, on it. So that's a little bit how I see. I think it's going to be a very active market. I said today on CNBC in the morning, had a really good session with the Squawk team, uh, but I think 2021 will be the year the startups are revitalized in the US. I, I think it is back to the future if we're gonna be successful as a country, and I think it will be. Sure, so Sarah Biller from West Virginia, Vantage Ventures has a question. And she All wants right. to know, yeah, hi Sarah. Now, Sarah. Remember, I love you. You're really good. I've always said nice things about you. If you want to rephrase your question, you can, Sarah. <laughs> All right. No, go uh, ahead. What's the question? I was just teasing. Right. I really like yeah, this. I know, she, I know. She probably more than anyone else in West Virginia was the central Emmy engine that brought all of the disparate groups from literally uh, the Virgin Hyperloop, Richard Branson's company together with what the university is doing, together yeah. with what the government's doing with people giving back. She's an amazing operational and, and technology person. Okay, and she wants to know uh, how will venture capital be impacted by the relocation of entrepreneurs out of the Valley? Will investors follow the entrepreneurs to new places? That's a good question. Yeah, and the answer is yes. Uh, the, what has changed is venture capital knew the minute they got on a plane, their odds of success went down. And they also didn't, didn't like to leave in the Valley. <laughs> Just like the Boston 128 VC firms did not change to the West Coast. Yeah. Uh, and now three things are occurring. First is all of us have learned how to use Zoom and Google Meets and, and Cisco WebEx. And so now you can manage and invest anywhere in the world and you really can. The second thing that has changed is California, unfortunately, uh, is becoming a very difficult place to do business. It is not where I would look at my startup today if right. I were 25 years younger. Right. And it's largely self-inflicted. Uh, hopefully that will change. 
but you're now seeing companies not only leave, but venture capital money leave, but new startups aren't coming here as much. That offers an opportunity for all 50 states. And so as I alluded to earlier, one of my hottest startups is thinking about not do they have their primary location in, in Silicon Valley or New York where they are today, but is it Montana or Texas? And in both those locations, the, the political leaders are saying, what do we need to do to get you here? And the other two states are saying, we take you for granted uh, on it. So I think it offers huge opportunity. Fast forward, think of West Virginia in the future with a Virgin Hyperloop's capability that goes 700 miles an hour. You could have a location, remote West Virginia site and be at work in Chicago or New York in less than an hour. You right. could all of a sudden work remotely and enjoy your hiking and your skiing and your outdoor life in a, a university town like Morgantown uh, in terms of its excitement and work anywhere in the world. So yes, I think it offers huge opportunities, Sarah. And I'm counting on you helping me make that vision come true. Well, so I, I have a question for both of you. Are you gonna be uh, investing uh, in West Virginia startups through any kind of vehicle? Um, outside of your usual philanthropy, John, I know that you, Help so uh, in West school. Virginia, yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, in West Virginia, I, I love the state. We are making such transformational change. I didn't want anybody ever to say I was financially benefiting from what occurred there. By the way, same thing in France. And uh, uh, so in West Virginia, I, I gave what will, was initially in the 5 million area. And we will do, hopefully, if I'm successful in my startups, uh, a fair amount more over time, maybe a lot more over time, as the core contribution to do the startups and to change the curriculum in the university. And then for all the returns that I got uh, to go back to this group. Sarah's helping uh, start this with Vantage Ventures. And then I'm attracting people because you need venture capitalists who are going to make money. Otherwise, you aren't going to get that larger skill attracting that group in. So it's not because I don't believe. I clearly do believe. Uh, but it's one that I didn't want anybody ever to be able to challenge regardless of political party or did I have a chance to dramatically economically benefit. Because I do, in my startups, I do. I, I, I get tremendously good terms. And I didn't want anybody to say I got that in West Virginia and didn't treat my home state like I, I really believe in giving back. I see. I see. Makes sense. Uh, Ellie Nesser has a question. What do you think is the next big market disruptor that we should be looking for in the U.S.? Artificial intelligence. Okay. I would bet on it big time. Do, being with artificial intelligence at the wrong area of business or personal too early is just as bad as being too late. That's why you saw me focus on customer service support as the first big play in artificial intelligence. But it will go across every aspect of our lives. And I think it will be the most fundamental change since the internet in terms of changing the way you work, live, learn, and play. All right. Anthony Ayala has a question of you. How have you developed your leadership style over your career? How do the companies and CEOs you invest in today compare with those you interacted with in your Cisco days? Okay, so in the sequence you, you raised them. Give me the question one more time to make sure I got the I first know how The companies and CEOs that you invest in today, how do they compare with those you interacted with in your Cisco days? Any difference? Yeah, but there, I got that part. What was the first part of the question? How have you developed your leadership style uh, over your gotcha. career? All right, so two, two major questions. Let me uh, combine them. Uh, okay. In terms of uh, uh, one of the most unique compliments I ever got uh, was one of my toughest competitors who was part of an uh, AT&T Lucent when I didn't buy Lucent. And then he went on to run British Telecom and then uh, be the CEO of Alcatel Lucent. And, and we competed very aggressively and, and he was pretty tough on me at times, but fair. Uh, and uh, one day at the World Economic Forum, he came up and he said, John, I just want to tell you how amazing a job you've done in reinventing yourself and reinventing Cisco. Okay. And I was shocked. Uh, and then I realized he was really serious and I thanked him for the compliment. And then I said, well, that's why I believe leaders need to be in their job more than five years, 10 years or more is where you can be successful. And he smiled and he's Dutch by background. He said, now we're in disagreement again. He said, most leaders cannot reinvent themselves. They don't change. Uh, he said, you reinvented yourself. You reinvented Cisco again and again and again. 
And uh, he said, I'm very good at what I do. And he is. But he said, you watch, I switch jobs every four years or five years. And I began to get it, but he, tell, he could tell I wasn't there. He said, let me ask, ask you another question. How many of your leaders have you ever had in the same role for more than four to five years and be satisfied with the results? He had me. Only one, Joe Pinto. Out of the thousands of leaders that I had, only one. And the point that he's making, how my style had to change over the years is I had to reinvent myself, my energies, my strengths, and my limitations and play it out. And most leaders don't do that by nature. What you have to do with a startup is you've got to realize their break points, both in time, but also at, at 100 people, uh, 500 people, 1,500 people, 5,000. And if you as a leader don't constantly evolve and reinvent yourself and bring in new talent to complement your strengths and to make up for your weaknesses, uh, you will get left behind. So the answer is I, I try to do that all the time. Sometimes I might be slower than I need to, i.e. 2001, and it bit me uh, on it. Uh, and sometimes I move fast, almost too fast. It makes people nervous around me. I like the second one a lot better. Okay. Thoughts on AI? David Smith wants to know about K-12 education not progressed as far as one would expect. What do you think? I think he's being extremely kind. K-12 <laughs> in the U.S. is broken. We are non-competitive. We're putting our children at a tremendous disadvantage to almost every other developed nation in the world. We need a complete redo on education. And I hope that the political leaders will have the courage to do that. I doubt it, but I hope that they do because we're sending our kids into college and we've got still the best universities in the world, but Delta isn't as much, but our kids aren't near as qualified going to the universities as their counterparts are around the world. This is why I think the future of education is more around key concepts like open classrooms, a, a startup out of, out of France or uh, out school, uh, a startup out of Silicon Valley that has a whole new model for combining these technologies and really skipping a generation in traditional teaching. So do K through 12, they give back, they do it purely for the love uh, of education and teaching, but we restrict them and they restrict themselves on really teaching the way that students need to be taught. We're still teaching like I was trained. In fact, some of the class books or our textbooks are still the same. And the industry is changing, used to be every 20 years, then every 10, now every three years. We're time for a redo in K through 12. Okay, good. We have a question from Paris, Benjamin Jaffe, uh, partner at SOSB. Uh, his question, what do early stage uh, science tech heavy companies do wrong most often before they reach a growth phase and hire a good head of sales? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got it. An engineer by background or a salesperson that wants to remind his engineering lead. So yeah. what, what companies do well initially uh, before they, they get into the growth and hire a head of sales uh, is they really get their strategy and vision right for what they're trying to do. And then they build great products. And then as you start to see the products start to get ready to come to market, then you begin to think about your go-to-market strategy and you need a very good sales leader. And for she or he, it's gonna be different than the lead thinks. It isn't a business development person who can talk like an engineer. It's truly something that knows how to sell, scale organizations, build lasting customer relationships, bond and trust. Okay, good. Uh, Dean Reyes from uh, West Virginia University. Uh, when you think of successful educational models that help fuel or generate startups, what components, practices come to mind as the key ones? Well, first, I believe Javier is one of the best dean of business schools in the nation, uh, and he's a good friend. Uh, in terms of what makes the core ingredients, I think it is where uh, uh, Dean Reyes and uh, Gordon Gee, the president of West Virginia, yeah. are taking it. They are beginning to teach entrepreneurism as a requirement for all students yeah. and focus on outcomes and breaking down the silos within the various groups, which traditionally you were trained in an area, heaven forbid, if you ever wanted to get trained in another, now you say, how do you make it happen? And then I think it's a teaching, a confidence of dreaming and giving the students the skills to dream and make dreams come true. And then having the courage to take risk 
and knowing that all the risk you take will not necessarily work. Uh, but I believe in our home state. I believe they are changing at a tremendous pace. And I think they'll be the example for the rest of the US on what a true startup state means with all the constituencies, regardless of politics, geographic location, education, gender, uh, it, uh, it come together. Okay, and uh, one last question, if you have time for Alice, who's on the, uh, who's on the online audience. Do you want to know about your transition from uh, Cisco to JC2 Ventures? For me, uh, it was a transition that I probably should have even done earlier. Uh -huh. I, I love growth. I'm really bored at 10% growth. <laughs> and uh, secondly, uh, I'd achieved all my goals at Cisco and it was time to transition. And I think we did that in a world-class fashion. And I think there was courses taught in Harvard about how we did that. Right. Uh, but the transition for me is going to what I love. And I don't do anything, Rebecca, now that I don't love. I wish I was a little bit better person, but I'm, I, I'm at a stage of my life where I'm just gonna do things that are fun and I can make a difference on and change the world, hopefully one more time, including job creation and inclusion. But the hardest transition that people make coming from a big organization or a structured uh, government or educational organization is to realize that the startup community is very unstructured. It moves with tremendous speed. Your support systems are not in place and that you've gotta be comfortable and always being very close to a major problem. My, my, my startups have a problem every week. Oh, <laughs> one major problem a month. I'd forgotten about that. And there, part of it is that we've got to learn to add structure in a speed way, not in a bureaucracy way as you grow. So there are a lot of people that think they quote, want to be entrepreneurs and want to move from a big environment to a small. It's hard. You want to look into your soul and say, do you really like getting your hands dirty? Do you really like getting into the detail? Uh, do you really enjoy an unstructured, uncertain environment where you may not have a job? You know, I, I knew my toughest decisions at Cisco were the two times where I took a stance that I knew that I may not have a job the next day, but I was willing to walk from that if I needed to. Uh, in the startups, you may not have a company, you may not make payroll. One of my toughest competitors at Cisco, uh, and I had a lot of uh, challenges with Nocera and Martin, the CEO there, uh, we've now become good friends and we're on joint boards together in my current life, but he four times almost didn't make payroll. I mean, that's normal in startups. And I told him that being a friend of his now, if I'd known that, I would have helped him in that career earlier. A uh, little bit of humor. But what I'm sharing with you is that in a small company, uh, uh, you've got to be comfortable with lack of support structure and you've got to build it at the right pace in a frugal way. That's a hard transition for people to make uh, uh, that you've got to realize when you do this, that's going to be an area you're going to have to adjust it. Right. For those of you who do, it is so fun. It's like <laughs> you're in heaven. <laughs> well, I can't think of a better way to end this session and but to also to thank John for his time, his generosity, uh, all of his commitment to uh, West Virginia, to entrepreneurs, to even Silicon Dragon, the time that you uh, have spent uh, with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, so well, let me just uh, make a few final remarks here. And I think we covered most of those questions. Um, and uh, okay, we got the questions as well. We didn't, we haven't done the poll yet, uh, but uh, I hopefully everyone did uh, look at our Silicon Dragon Best of CES show, which is on YouTube channel now. Uh, so you could just do a search of Silicon Dragon on YouTube and CES and you'll see it. Um, next week, uh, Brad Smith of Intuit and Wing to Wing. Um, and thank you, Invest Hong Kong, for your support for the series. And, and thank, thank Brad you. Smith. He's a West Virginian also, a graduate of Marshall, and making a big difference in that state's transformation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I encourage everyone to sign up for the Silicon Dragon Circle. Uh, it's very easy, Silicon Dragon Circle 2021.eventbrite.com. And I want to uh, have a special shout out to Michael Jalliman, who just signed up today. Thank you, Michael. Uh, 
we have other people who are uh, cir circle members who uh, were on the uh, on the Zoom today as well. Oh, also one of my my I, I wanted to ask in my poll um, one final question. I don't think we have time to go through all of them, but um, would you like us to hold a networking session similar? Uh, a session online in place of one of our regular webinars with speakers so that everybody sees one another and we all network with one another. Um, so that's just a question for everyone. I would love to know the answer to that. And any other question you'd like to answer here? Um, your outlook for post for 2021, post inauguration. And John, you can answer any of these uh, verbally if you want. Uh, well, I'm an optimist for 2021. Uh, I think uh, President Biden, even though I'm from the other political party, uh, has done an amazing job since the election. Uh -huh. uh, I think he's going to bring our country back together. And if I were betting on the economic growth for this calendar year, I think that the second half of the year, the economic growth will be in the four to 6% GDP growth. And that I think this will be known as the year of the startup, restarting startups in America. Okay, very good, very good. Um, all right. Well, thank you, John. I uh, appreciate your time and all your insights. And uh, please, everyone, uh, sign on next week, next Thursday. It's going to be at 2 p.m. Pacific time, a little bit earlier. And thank you again, John. Uh, I learned so much, and I think the online audience did as well. Thank you Rebecca, again. Thank you. You make it easy. You're a joy to follow. Uh, thank you. Take care now. Bye. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.